Thank you, everyone. Now we break for tea. Just a moment, Balaji. Uh, And start the next session. Our next session is performance. Chairperson of this session is Barbara Hodridge, University of California, Santa Barbara. I request her to come on to the dais. Our first speaker of the session is Dr. V. Mohan, CPR Institute of Indological Research. I also invite him to the stage. I where we are today, and he also has authored, based on his PhD dissertation, a book called Abdullah Charita, a chronicle and analytical study on Mughal history, and which was published in 2015. He has many other accomplishments, but I think I'll be brief to give him more time for his talk. Mukam karoti vachalam, pangum langayate girim, get kripata maham vandi, paramonan the madabam, wagi sadhya sumanasaha, sarvartana mupakrami, yimnatwa katakutyas yuhu, tamnamami gajananam, Sadasiva Samaram Bam, Sankarachar Yamadhyamam, Asmatachar Yapadyantam, Vande Guru Paramparam, Sachitananda Rupaya, Viswot Patya the Hateway, Tapatraya Vinasaya, Sti Krishna Yavayam Numaha, Janma Desya Yaton Vayat, Etherta Swate, Shobignes Varad, Tene Brahma Yahdai Adika Vay, Muhyanti Yat Surayaha. Tejovari Murdam, Yatabinimio, Yatrisar Gum Risha, Damna Swena Sada Nirasta Hogam, Satyam Param Dimahi, Dadma Projita Kaita Votra Paramo, Nilbatsara Nam Satam, Vedium, Vastum, Atravasta Visadam, Tapatrayon Mulanam, Streamat Bagavate, Mahamunikarte, Kimba Pari, Iswaraha, Sadjo Hurdavarjati, Kritibihi, Munibisusu Shivista Chanat, Negamakalpatar or Galitam Palam, Sukha Mukat, Amutha Dravasam Yutam, Pibata Bhagavata Rasam Rasam Alayam, Muhuraho Rasika Bhu Bhavukaha, Yam Pravrajanta Manubeta Mape the Kirtyam, Dwaipa Yano Virahakatar Ahua Ajuhave, Putre Putre the Tanmayataya, Taravo Bhine Duhu, Tam Sarvabhuta Hadayam Munimana Tosmi, Barha Piram Nadavarabhu, Karnayo Karnikaram, Vibradvasa Kanakakavisam, Vaja in team Jamalam, Randran Venu, other Sodaria, Gobayan, Purayan, Gobrandi, Brunda, Ranyam, Sopadaramanam, Pravisat Gita Girti, Yam Brahma, Runendra Rudra Murtaha, Stunventi Divya Istavai, Veda Isanga Padakramo Panishadi, Gayanti, Yam Samagaha, Diana Vastita Tadgatena, Manasa, Pastinti, Yam Yogino. Yasyantam Navidu, Sura Suraganaha, Deva Yatasmai Namaha, Kyatasri Ramadut of Pavanatanubu of Pingalak Chasikavan, Sita Soka Pahari, Dasamukhavijayi Lakshpan of Pranadata, Aneta Beshajadrehe, Lavana Jalanide, Langane, Dikshito Yaha, Vira Streaman Hanuman, Mama Manasivasan, Katyasidim Tanotu. In fact, this is the live tradition. This is how the Upanyasakas of modern threads, they initiate or they begin the Upanyasa in such a way, invoking. In fact, they don't, they never mind in invoking for such a quite long duration. Because Pipata Bhagavata Rasam, we are dissecting something. This is the original version, in fact. Blessed and distinguished scholars from the various parts of the world. I offer my humble pranams at the lotus feet of the Supreme Being, who is the living and guiding force behind everything and every creature in this Brahmanda, omnipotent and omnipresent. Just to think, when we sleep, what will happen if our inner vital wheels cease their activities? Believing and trusting that we are going to wake up again, we fall asleep. If people start thinking that they will not breathe again when they wake up, 
Would you think that anyone will close their eyes? No one will. Creation is the only wonder in this world. The whole universe is the combination of panchabhutas, starting from the grass to the subtle bodies. The theory of panchikarna provides the details in a clear perspective in this regard. Especially the theory of panchikarna is more relevant in creation of human beings, Adi Shankara explained in a clear way. At the same time, could anyone specifically codify with perfect proof and accuracy and claim what was the first creature created in this world, who was the first human being or of what gender? With utmost reverence to all the religions, I would like to say that each and every sect of religion interprets these things shooting to their convenience and beliefs. This way, religion, the religion is nothing but a system of a life, chisels and molds the way of life of a human being. For example, when I chant, Yetra Yetra Raghunath Kirtanam Tatra Tatra Katamastha Kanjalim Vashpavari Paripurna Lochanam Marutim Namataraksha Santakam A few years back, when Upanyasaka was chanting this sloka, uh, a, a person came and prostrated before the deities there. Someone was trying to find a tail on him because this sloka says, wherever the Rama's name is being chanted, Hanuman will be there. So we cannot search here, but that is the belief here. That makes the thing very pleasant, in fact. So this introduction has become mandatory. Since the matter we have been discussing here all these three days in such a thought-provoking topic, because inscrutable ways of the gods. In fact, I have to thank, half-hearted thanks to Jack here, because almost he has covered my subject here. I was wondering, uh, immediately, because I do not know what to do then, in fact. Immediately after some time, someone came to me and I, was, I have been given an instruction, please cut short your speech for five minutes, reduce five minutes. So see the correlation here. That is what the ways of the God, in fact. So the, in Bharata Varsha especially, our great seers and sages, even the Granthakartas, they were not very keen on boasting and reluctant to provide personal details, only concentrating on the significance of their work. As far as the ancient texts are concerned, no one can ascertain when and on which specific date a work was being started and completed since the author was not particular about those details. This aspect is very special to the works of Sanatana Dharma of Hindustan. For example, we claim Apurishati of Vedas. As sincere followers of the system, we have to accept the belief. The same claim persists even in determining the date and times, at times the authorship of the origin of priceless works. We are, we are just deducing the available text with us, that's all, nothing else. We cannot exactly find out what, still we say, we think, we have, we assume, that's all. Apart from this, there are many other factors, lack of uniform calendar systems, vastness of India that was ruled by many big kingdoms and small chieftains, prevalence of various almanacs, Vikrama, Sambat, etc., etc., regional-wise. These are all the hurdles in determining the uniform historicity of your work. However, we cannot deny the fact that the works contain matters of importance, values, the traditional values, and the essential principles on life system, and so on. Vedas are of a unique gender of their own, including the language, structure, and style, requiring a lot of skills like siksha, chandas, etc., to gain proficiency over them. They are the highest holy text of Sanatana Dharma. But in these circumstances, epics and Puranas come in handy as the religion should help everyone to achieve the Purusharthas. In fact, the epics and Puranas are the quintessence of Vedic tenets given in an uncomplicated standard for all to learn, cognize and the nuances and to follow. More so, as they are in the poetry form and mostly didactic in nature, it gives liberty for even a common man to comprehend them in an easy manner. And the preservation of ancient texts. We have been preserving our sacred literature down the ages through various modes and various strenuous endeavors. We owe a lot to our great sages, known and unknown, who formulated the ways to preserve the treasures of our tradition, culture, and heritage. In the case of epics and Puranas, various methods have been adopted to conserve and sustain them for such a long period. A few methods of keeping them as like this, preserving the manuscripts, with, of course, with modern techniques of digitalization, the printed versions, the oral methods like Parayana of the original text, Upanyasa, spiritual and divine discourses in various formats, pictorial representations, 
art, drawings and sculptures and in recent times through multimedia presentations also. The origin of Bhagavata, in fact I am cutting short brief, the Bhagavata first, as the instance of Narada, it's almost started like Upanyasa tradition. Ka Narada composed, ka sage, composed by sage Vyasa. Vyasa taught to his son Sukha. Sukha recited this to King Parikshit and everyone knows that and subsequently Ugrastavas, better known as Suta Pauranika, he recited the Bhagavata to Saunaka and uh, other Brahmans. And sages assembled in the Naimisha forest during the session of the sacrifice performed by Saunaka. Bhagavata Purana and its significance. Though Bhagavata Purana is one of the 18 major Puranas, it is unquestionably the greatest and most popular of the Puranas. The Puranas generally contain a strange combination of fables and fairy tales, philosophy and religion. The Bhagavata Purana contains the highest principles of ethics expounded in fitting language. There is earnestness and enchantment in the devotional songs which attunes the mind to the high theme. For example, Gopika Gitam. It's a poem to shoot different moods and emotions. The mood of adoration or worship, of sorrow or joy, of peace and tranquility, of discontent with the things of the world and a desire for freedom from its constraints, of humility and regret over wasted opportunities for salvation, of perplexity about the mysteries of the universe and the ways of God are of passionate yearning for union with the God. The highest conception of bliss is not, accord, not according to the Hindu mind, not mere prostration and service at the foot of the Almighty, but a loving union with Him. The essential truths it emphasizes repeatedly are the imperishability of the soul, the goodness, power and the helpfulness of God and attainment of salvation by the method of bhakti. No other work in the Hindu religious literature has made a careful study of the psychology of bhakti than Bhagavata. The Bhagavata formulates not a single format of bhakti, of course, but in nine variations, Sravanam, Kirtanam, etc. So Bhagavatam is not a mere holy text alone. It is nothing but Lord Krishna himself. Someone was making a context here. Why the, uh, Madam was giving an explanation also. Why the picture is, we need not uh, try to make meaning of each and everything. But here it is the meaning. It is the text is nothing but Lord Krishna himself. Lord Krishna himself says. So he declares, I am the divine Bhagavata. So that is the representation. Moreover, Vyasa says, Satyam Param Dhimahi, in the beginning. So the Lord Krishna of Satya Swarupa. The word Satya here does not reflect the verbatim meaning truth, but that one which is constant and never undergoes any change. Satyam Jnanam Anantam Brahma. So on probing, one can easily find an interesting fact here that Srimad Bhagavata begins with Lord Krishna and ends with him. Even the last one at the twelfth scandal, you can see, it begins with the uh, ends with the Satyam Param Dhimahi. So thus the whole text represents Lord Krishna himself. The poet Kalidasa says, Tamsantaha Sotumarhanti Sadasat Vyakti Hetavaha Hemnaha Samlekshate Hyagnu Visuddhihi Syami Kapiva. So testimony and appreciation has to be attested by a deserving forum. The glory and greatness of Bhagavata is described in various texts with a special mention to Padma Purana and Skanda Purana. Generally, generally in our region, someone was asking also that Sabdaha Jnana Jnana about the Mahatmya. So here, in this tradition here, the Upanyasakas are Pauranikas. Before beginning the Bhagavata Sabdaha, chant the slokas from the Bhagavata Mahatmya from Padma Purana, usually, and explain the significance of the Bhagavatam, because it contains everything. So thus the paper makes an earnest attempt to find out the various techniques and procedures followed by learned people in course of their upanyasams, that is the divine de devotional discourses, with specific reference to Bhagavata Purana and how they help in keeping the original text intact. The word, interpretation of the word upanyasa. The word upanyasa means placing the matter or ideas before. Upanyasyate iti upanyasaha. Upa samipe, that is purobhage. Nyasastu prastave, one of the meaning. Vishayam upanyasyate iti upanyasaha. The Amarakosaha, the Amarakosa defines Upanyasas to Vang Mukham. In fact, Vang Mukham refers to an extempore speech on a subject. The Pauranika gives a detailed description of the story that was recited from original text in the earlier part of the day, that is the Saptaha Parayana. Vaijayanti, another Kosa defines as Upanyasaha Purovachaha. And this Upanyasa, genesis of the Upanyasa, we come to know that the tradition of speaking to the assembled people was found from the Vedic period itself. 
it is presumed by scholars like Winternitz that, in quotes, similar to the Vedic Samhitas, there existed one or several collections of Itihasas and Puranas made up of myths and legends. During the Brahmana period, the recital of narrative poems formed a part of religious ceremonies at the sacrificial and domestic festivals. Thus, the daily recitation of legends of gods and heroes belonged to the preliminary celebration which lasted a whole year of the great horse sacrifice. Quotation ends. According to S. Bhattacharya, it was this sacrificial milieu which led to the formation of the following main topics dealt with in the Puranas. It is Sarga, Pratisarga, Vamsa, Vamnanvantra and Vamsa Anucharita. These topics formed an integral part of the making of a Purana as given in the Amarakosha. Of course, some scholars like G.V. Devasthali, they have a different opinion on this count. But Bhagavata Pravachanam is not merely a storytelling activity, but it is an oral tradition of bringing out the matter under the discourse as an enjoyable and pleasant experience in original. One of the greatest advantages of Upanyasa tradition is that the discourse makers can recite the original slokas, make an elaborate analysis of the subject, compare with other texts, and can make a great impact on the emotional assimilations of the audience shooting to the occasion. For example, Chikuram Bahulam Viralam Brahmaram, Murdulam Vachanam Vipulam Nayanam, Adharam Maduram Vadanam Lalitam, Chapalam Charitam Nukadanu Bhave, Leela Sukha Praise is yearning to Lord Krishna. Imagine when an Upanyasaka describes with bhava, see the, how the Krishna will visualize in the mind, mind of the, the audience here. Imagine, so Krishna dances before the listeners in a picturesque manner. Thus the role of discourse makers is very significant and paramount. The main purport which lo will be lost if a Pauranika chances to describe a portion of an emotion-filled situation or event like this without exhibiting any bhava or any signs of excitement and makes a speech filled with monotony. In fact, I made an example from Bhagavata also, that Barha Pedam Natavaravapuhu, I am skipping here for want of time, and origin of, origin of Upanya, Barha Pedam Natavaravapuhu, Karnayo Karnikaram, just imagine, Vibradvasaha Kanakakabisam Vaijayantim Chamalam, Randhran Venor, Gopika sings the flute saying, Randhran Venor, Adara Sudaya, Purayin Gopavandahi, Brindaranyam, Swapada Ramanam Pravisat Gita Kirtihi. See. So the original Upanyasa tradition, we need not go in a lot of search of uh, the storytelling method of Bhagavata. It is clearly mentioned in the Bhagavata text itself. The first chapter of the first skanda gives the backdrop of the origin of the Bhagavata and Katha tradition as well. The Katha here is singing, the singing the glory of God. Naimishe Animishak Chetre Rishayaha Saunakadayaha Satram Swargaya Lokaya Sahastra Samam Asata. So meaning is self-explanatory. Then one day sages and saunakas and others after finishing their morning which rites, respectfully asking the Sutta Pauranika, that is the Kataka, thus you are the most learned of Puranas, Itihasas and Dharma Sastras. You must have learnt all this in detail from the noble Pasaptas like Vyasa and others. However, the lifespan of people in this Kali Yuga, that is shooting to the Kali Yuga is very important, is very short. So moreover, people in general, see in those days when this was written, now. We cannot compare even the medicine now, what is going on, the material prosperities. So uh, people are in general lazy and dull-witted and ill-fortunated. So it is difficult for them to grasp the true import of the holy text and scriptures. The holy texts are vast and varied with a lot of detail, details explaining the duties to be performed. Saying so, the Rishi is requesting Sutta to impart the essence of the holy scriptures to them with his expertise, which would help them to redeem themselves thereby attaining supreme peace. During their interaction, the sages requested Sutta to answer their questions regarding the purpose of the descent of Lord Krishna on this earth and his noble doings in his various avatars. That is why we have got a lot of avatars in Bhagavata Purana. The doing sung by Narada and other seers. The sages requested Sutta with great humbleness to give them all the glories and implications of the avatars of God as they were grossly interested to hear the nobility and great deeds of Lord. Also as Kali Yuga started and Lord Krishna having gone back to his eternal abode, where should dharma seek their protection? Then the sutta, who was very much pleased and compassionate, replies them, and those who were assembled there. He begins paying his respects to sage Vyasa, Sukha, and others, Lord Narayana, Yam Prabhrajanta Manubhetam Vedakritam, so Munimana Tosmi, and then again Narayanam Namaskritya Naram Chayvanarajna. 
So Sutta appreciated the efforts of and the inquisitiveness of the sages, saying that the inquiries they were raising were very relevant and important, and also having intended upon the total welfare and aspiration of the whole world and mankind. And he highlights the priority of Bhakti Marga in attaining liberation and Lord Krishna over Karma Marga and other ways. He explains the gains and modes to attain the Purusharthas related to mundane life. That is Dharmartha, Kama and other implications. Moreover, to attain Bhakti, the basic requirements are Jnana and Vairagnya. Sutta emphatically stresses the attainment, attainment of the grace of Sri Hari is the true end of proper way of discharging one's duties, sacred and common to all according to the social customs. Further, he stated in the Kali Yuga, the holy text Bhagavata itself represents Lord Krishna. Bhagavatam and Bhagavan Krishna are not different entities and they are one and the same. So thus the importance of Bhakti is being highlighted in the Bhagavata Purana, which is a quick means for salvation. And prelude to this, two stories of importance had been depicted in Padma Purana in the Mahatmya. Of course, the Jnana Vairagya story we have seen in detail with the pictorial rep representations and other ways. So the details which are left out, I am very, just I make it very brief. So Narada on this pilgrimage to the holy places, Tirtasthalas thought that he would be meeting a lot of people. He was very much interested while he was descending, immersed in devotion. He would be thinking the whole world will be full of bhakti. Following the pious path, however, his expectation was not true. He saw and observed the nature, the lackadaisical attitude of the people, and their aggressive and deep involvement in worldly pursuits. Lack of devotion to the holy customs and the mundane lifestyle hurt him very much and he became very disheartened. When he visited the town called Vishala, Sanaka and other sages asking him about the reason for his unhappiness and whereupon Narada expresses his observations and the evil effects of Adharma of Kali and misbehavior of the people. And Narada continues, when he reached the banks, about he describes the bhakti and the Jnana and Vairagya, Bhakti as mother, young mother and Jnana and Vairagya as the two children who became old, old at the young age in fact, attaining the old age and the Bhakti was speaking to Narada and she was telling about the plight and he, she says uh, birthplace, her birthplace as Dravida Desa and, and gaining that somewhere he was, she was reluctant and lost her gain and strength and she became old became weak and only when she came to Brindavana she gained some strength and in fact Narada said that Kali Kali in Kali good conduct and characteristics penance dhyana and disappeared the good natured people were put into hardships and sufferings the evil natured people had a prosperous and happy a question mark life and muscle power became the art of the day people with material prosperity led a happy life because of the carelessness of Kali Jnana and Vairagya being uncared for and became old. So, and only in Vrindavana, as there is some bhakti, you gained her, your strength, he says. And as I am Lord devoted to Hari, that is, Narada promises, I will do whatever I can do to spread the bhakti. And his efforts to make the jnana and vairagya become futile there, then they travels. And also, even after singing Vedic hymns and Gita, they were not able to. Uh, what we call the revive the bhakti and uh, jnana and vairagya. Then Narada reaching Bhardhirikastama, whereupon the jnana and vairagya and the assembled gathering, they are making the gatherings here. Only Upanyasa part I am touching here, sorry. And when Sanat Kumara is reaching the banks of the Ganges along with the Narada, see the assembled, who, we are here, Brugus and Chavanas and everyone, see the assembly, great assembly here, according to Mahatmya and to hear the Bhagavata from Sutta. On one side, sages Bhrugu, Vashishta, Chavana, Gautama, Mehdati, Devala, Yajnavalkya, Parasurama, Viswamitra, Sakala, Markandeya, Dattayatriya, and other Vyasa and Parasara, and holy rivers headed by Ganga, holy lakes such as Pushkara, the holy places, Dandakavana and other forests, and mountains like Meru and Himalayas. On the other side, celestial beings such as Devas, Gandharvas and Kinaras, Vedas and Upanishads. Ne, 17 Puranas are also were present to hear the Bhagavata Mahatmya. And the six Sastras. And on another, another side, the presiding deities of holy places and others were sitting there expectantly for Sanat Kumara. And Sanat Kumara duly honored with proper sight and explaining 
and hearing the Bhagavata is similar to attain liberation moksha at hand by simply hearing it. And greatness of Bhagavata Purana, Kumara e explaining everything, is Ashwamedha sacrifice and sacrifices and hundreds of Vajabaya sacrifices. Even they cannot equate one sixteenth of reading a Bhagavata. And a person who is not listening anything is nothing but a burden on this earth, they confirm. And the procedure for Parayana of Upanyasa, almost uh, my friend has explained, the auspicious time, the sufficient amount, and all the materials, and even the months have been specified. And it is mentioned there that even the news, it should be Saptaha Jnana Jnana. That is the, everything should be uh, spread, the news should be spread to, the, to be known to the people all, all the in, in and around the places. And Bhagavata, letters also should, everything almost. Details regarding the Saptaha should be clearly intimated. The interested people should at least attend only, at least for a day. And about the place also it has given description. And the qualification of Upanyasa also is being given there. A ca only a cal qualified and learned scholar with extensive knowledge of Vedas and Sastras, combined with staunch faith in the philosophy of Bhagavata and a devo devotee of Lord Vishnu, should be engaged in the discourse of Bhagavata. So the Bhagavata Banyaska should physically and mentally purify himself, uh, and uh, he should offer his prayers to gods and to the text of Bhagavata also. And restrictions of food also being given there for the diet routine for the speaker and to the listeners as well. And uh, it is mentioned that an able learned assistant also can be accompanying the uh, Bhagavata who is uh, making the discourse makers to ward off the doubts also. And the formalities to be followed by all concerned to reap the optimum benefit of participating in the Bhagavata Saptaha Jnana Ekyam. And Sanat Kumara highlighting the glory, I have, I cut short very short. So highlighted all the glories of Bhagavata and benefits of the Saptaha Stavana Mahatmya. So, so Saunaka inquired of him about the efficacy of Bhagavata to the present day situation. Then Sutta explained the inquiries of Uddhava to Sri Krishna and uh, requesting him not to leave the Krishna. Then Lord infused all his glory and energy into the Bhagavata and disappeared. Therefore, Bhagavata is a visible, verbal manifestation of Sri Hari. At the time, Bhakti along with Vairagya and Jnana, with regaining of their youth, chanting names of Lord Krishna, Krishna, Govinda, Hari, Murare, they come out and Sanat Kumaras observed that they had emerged about of the substance of Bhagavata. Bhakti thanked Kumaras and, where she, and she was requesting where she has to say. And she was instructed, they instructed her to dwell in the minds of the devotees of Lord Vishnu. Just to think of Lord Vishnu, Bhakti is there, Vairagya is there, Jnana is there, Narayana, that is what Kalu Nama Sankirtanam you used to say. So in another story, I will make it very brief in two minutes. The Atma Deva, the story which is given to me in fact. Atma Deva, in fact in this story, the story related to Atma Deva and Dunduli his wife and Dundukari and the, popularly the story is known as Gokarna story in fact. The fruit which was given to be eaten by Dunduli was given to a cow by her. We have five minutes, maybe one, two questions. You want to, Dr. Mani Mohan, you want to take some questions? We have a, a text that is in 12 skandhas. We have uh, reference to the uh, Purnama as the last day of the recitation. Why do you think it was historically that the number seven was chosen as the number in which number of days in which uh, uh, it is uh, in fact uh, in one of the interviews I had in my, uh, because they said the Parichit has the Parichit had the seven days to live his life that is one of the ideas given to me in fact well, that's absolutely true in yeah. terms of the text itself yeah. but what I'm asking about is I think and specifically with relation to South India other performance traditions that are also based that's just seven day based I'd be very interesting to hear about uh, seven days, even now it is going to happen in February. In fact, the seven days, Saptaha Jnana, those who cannot complete or the, uh, they cannot take up the Mula Parayana, they select the very important incidents in the Bhagavata and they complete in seven days. Avatars, the important part. Uh, for example, if you take up Ramayana, they are doing it for nine, day, nine days. Yeah, for the, uh, re, de, denoting the Naomi of Rama, Rama Naomi, in the same way. So, 
the, there is no significance. In fact, in those days, the Bhagavata Upanyasa being conducted for continuously for 30 days and all. There is no particular significance at all. <laughs> Since it has become a professional approach for time buying everything, as now to, for, sorry, excuse me, pardon me, sir. So, at the same time, back to back, uh, uh, Mr. G conducted this Ramanza and the back to back for a lot of conveniences. These seven days might have been taken up also. <laughs> In fact, the cow after some time, it begets a son with the two years of a cow and so that uh, was named as Gokarna with learning with all the sastras and then finally uh, this Gokarna Dunduli, uh, Dundukari, not a original son, son of the Atmadeva's wife's sister's son in fact, uh, who came there with all his misbehavior, he misbehaves and he makes, in fact Atmadeva was told by a sage that it is your fate, don't worry, you will not have any children for seven births. But this Atma Deva was very, very, what we call, he was very much concerned about as Dilipa in Raghomsa, concerned about the, his rituals to be performed to his ancestors. So at, at the time now, the Sanya, the, the sage, the sage, he gives me a fruit, in fact it goes away. So it was not eaten by his wife and to be uh, uh, given to the cow. So the cow got the son, a holy son, in fact, Gokarna. So the main purport of this Gokarna story is here, what I would like to emphasize here, because for want of time I have just uh, make everything. And uh, see, the Dindugari, he, he was uh, just uh, killed, in fact, and he was roaming here in the form of an evil spirit, of an evil spirit. This Gokarna, by performing a Saptaha, that is Bhagavata Saptaha, he liberates the evil spirit of the Bhagavata also. So, at the, where, whereupon the Bhagavata Saptaha was uh, engaged, he was just uh, to finding a place where to be there. There was a bamboo with the seven holes, seven knots, and whereupon this uh, Dunduka, that is the spirit of Dundukari entered upon there, and each and every day when the Saptaha was completed, each and every knot started bursting out. Friends, the bamboo is nothing but our own self, representation of our own self. We used to say that Arishadvarga, so Kama, Krodha, Loba, Moha, Mada, Matsarya, climbing with the ego, once you shed this, you can liberate yourself from this and you can merge with the Lord. That is the main idea of that story of the Dundukari there. And in fact, I here leave here, a short make. And the course of Saptaha Parayana also given there, Devas break up as also given Manukardama Sambada Paryantam Pratamiya Hani, Bharatakyana Paryantam Dutiya Hani Vachayet, Trutiya Divese Kutya, Saptamas Kandapuranam, Krishna Vibhava Paryantam Chatutam Divese Vadet, Rukmini Udvaha Paryantam Panchamaya Hani Sasyate, Sri Hamsakyana Paryantam Sashtya Hani Vadet Sudihi, Saptame to Dine Kuryate, Bhagavata Sevai, Purti Bhag Evam, Nidvignata Siddhi, Viparyaya Ito Anyata. And uh, the English meaning I'm not giving here. In normal parlance, uh, Bhagavata Saptaha completing, Bhagavata Saptaha is buying, conducted as a Saptaha Jnana Yajna with the dedication. In general, normally, you know, Mula Parayanam of the text reading with the original version will take place in the morning session and pre evening session also. And in the evening session, the discourse will be conducted with the explanation and description of the text. The Upanyasaka will at ease explain all the stories and everything, whatever being chanted in the morning and besides Padma Purana, Vishnu Purana, Vishnu Kanda of Skanda Purana also gives in detail the glory of Bhagavata and in recent times the development then that was the origin in Upanyasas of Bhagavata has gone through the stages to be performed in the functions, temples and uh, even on private functions marking the occasions, marking celebrations for example 60th birthday, Shashti of the Bhuti etc etc since uh, as a marking of the holy time to commemorate their, in fact, as a token of our thanks or gratitude to the God, in fact. Like Sundrakanda Parayana, of course, even in many parts of the India, not even men, even women, someone was talking, do the Parayana of Bhagavata here and there. In fact, yesterday our, uh, the president, uh, we respected uh, Sudhasana was uh, telling that uh, the stories of Bhagavata are not new to him because his grandmother, that is the homely tradition, the stories of Bhagavata came here. And in the yester years, 
till very recent years this parayana or pravachanas were not being done for any remunerative purpose or not expecting any remuneration at all in fact you, you must be knowing this nama sankirtana in those villages they used to give after the everything what all the the remaining tamarind rice or what are curd rice you used to say in in bamboo bamboo baskets they will keep this for one week and eat this is the remuneration what they were getting so the bhakti was the main purpose there even now so but however in recent times besides spiritual uh, devotional spreadings of bhakti this practice has become followed with an upgraded uh, versions uh, with modern trends also artha dharma of course we shouldn't say dharma has taken it wrong back artha and kama is becoming important these discourse makers even earns their livelihood and becoming a professionals of this art of upanyasa in fact the final word here and upanyasakas of bhagavata purana a few names because we cannot leave of them the other terms we use for the discourse is harikatha katha kalakshepa pravachanam prabhashanam etc according to brahmasti nachur venkatraman a famous upanyasaka in nowadays in recent trends i had an interview with him in fact some time back i went and for this purpose and he is of the opinion in parts of kerala what he says this program is conducted as a udaya asthamana bhagavata saptaham that is the parayanam of the text will commence in the morning followed with the discourse continuously with short breaks the whole day like this because 18000 verses they have to complete for the all days so the same way dr brahmasri subraman who renders discourse along with his sister alamelu i think you must be enjoying their calling and arthanam from the bhagavata a fantastic ex- exponents of that one another prolific upanyasaka opens that bhagavata upanyasam is also being rendered in the form of harikatha as a musical discourse and brahma sri krishna premi sri velukudi krishnan damodara dikshitar sundar kumar oya sundar and sri manar gudi rajagopal ganapathyal and with the next section of sri mati prema pandrang who you there are the few experts of bhagavata in recent times who are rendering human service in the propagating the prophecy of bhagavata mahapura in this area i am not uh, taking up other areas and brahma sri sengal varam anantara anantara dikshitar velukudi varadacharya mayoram brahma sri sivaram krishna ganapadhyal very few stalwarts in advocating this doctrines of history yes and in fact for your information uh, late sri brahma sri babu dikshitar has gotten obtained a doctorate in this upanyasaka tradition for this and concluding remarks it is to be pointed out that dealing with such holy and spiritual based text like bhagavata in a pedagogic and academic outlook may not serve the whole total purpose of the getting the bhakti rasa so the vision should be broader spiritual and open approach accepting the contents based on beliefs suppose if you say 30 to feet we have to accept the belief that is very important the main purpose of this text is to stir up the inner sentiments of bhakti love and devotion to god surrendering the self to the lord and other ways and means to experience and enjoy god a spiritual seeker who is in pursuit of merging himself with the supreme self through bhakti thus the bhagavata purana bridges the gulf between the known and unknown the transient and the eternal the grass and subtle this world and the future worlds and finally the jiva and paramatma thank you one of the very important themes you mentioned is that how the lord is saying that krishna is bhagavat itself so my query is that in simad bhagavat gita in biswarupa darsana yoga krishna is saying you know the he is there in many things in the brakhyanam aswastham but in that narration is there any reference to the text being lord itself but in it in bhagavat purana in bhagavat purana it is there yeah please hear my question yeah, please, in, please. in uh, if, if in bhagavat purana there is the reference to the lord himself becoming text so how do we look at bhagavat gita and bhagavat purana in terms of looking at person and text and if we bring the performative dimension so my query is that you know whether there is a very interesting way to look at the embodiment of divine vis-a-vis text but if it is reading to a different kind of a textualization or something else uh, see there is always a difference between uh, uh, enjoying or having an idea from the original itself our textualization is entirely different in fact uh, 
it is said, when we say that the recitation of the mantras or the slokas, it has their own value in fact. So textualization is entirely different. But it is the statement given there by the Lord, we are, we are, we are accepting it, that's all, nothing else. Thank you. The second, third presentation, we'll move that second, and then we'll have a video presentation from McCormick Taylor. Okay. This presentation is by Hanumat Prasheka Swami. He has been uh, working extensively in the area of Shastric studies within the International Society for Krishna Consciousness for many years, and also outside of ISKCON in various academic and cultural institutions. And he is currently visiting professor in world classical literature at Ricardo Palma University in Lima, Peru. So today he will be speaking about Srimad Bhagavatam and the contemporary reflections, reflections, from reflections from 40 years of teaching. So I'll repeat, Srimad Bhagavatam in the contemporary world, reflections from 40 years of teaching. Good afternoon. Actually, I was born on Guam in the Marianas Islands at the end of World War II. I grew up in California, and I started in electrical engineering at the University of California. Then I changed to biological engineering, was doing surgery on rats and dogs, and they all lived afterwards. And then I changed to psychology and, and graduated in psychology, first place with minor studies in biology and electrical engineering. Then I started the doctorate in Northwestern. I met my mentor was president of the American Psychological Association, Donald Campbell. And he gave me the impetus, impetus to head east. So I got a, uh, a black belt in Okinawan karate, <laughs> by which I learned a lot about prana. I studied with the improvisational theater troupe in Chicago and eventually came in contact with uh, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami and his whole Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition. And so at that point, we can go to our PowerPoint show. <laughs> okay. So what we're doing here, I mean, I'm going to move this a little bit. Ah, my gosh. The PowerPoint show I made up is probably long enough to last for two weeks, so we'll go through it quickly. Uh, Paschatya Desha Tarine, Srimad Bhagavatam, and the scientific mindset. Actually, our presentation should have been in the previous section on dissemination of the Bhagavatam. So here we're talking about dissemination of the Bhagavatam as we... Excuse me, sir. Yeah. I, I know, I'm conscious really of it. I'm conscious of it. I have a black belt in karate. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, dissemination of the Bhagavatam as, as we're receiving it, we're, we're becoming very enriched by this program, seeing all the di by diverse Bhagavatam perspectives, and ours is just one perspective coming especially through A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Rupa Goswami, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So, uh, go ahead here. Okay. Anvaya Vyatireka Byam Yat Syat Sarvatra Sarvada, Shema Bhagavatam 2.9.36. And of course, this is part of the uh, Chatur Shloki. And the suggestion by Shema Narayan is that this knowledge must be understood in all places, all circumstances, and all times. And therefore, of course, it's also appropriate for the Western world, you know, the industrialized world, you know, and here, for example, in this Western scientific world is a cow eating a chapati, <laughs> okay? But of course, over here, we have the, uh, the scientific view, scientific view of, the, of how a cow eats a chapati, okay? Then we have a uh, fireman fighting a fire and saving one of the citizens of the, uh, the house. And of course, they were called Somebody called them to come to fight the fire. And again, we have a, uh, a machine, which is described again, you know, in a very scientific, rational Euclidean process. And even the US government, 
George Washington, he had to fight battles. He had so much personal austerity, right, to establish the government. And Dwight David Eisenhower had so much austerity to establish it. And they both became leaders of the executive branch. But again, trying to describe everything as a machine, as a machine, a chemical machine, an electrical machine, or even in this case, a social machine. And this is the one ambience in which we're trying to present Srimad Bhagavatam. Okay. So especially, we, we would present that there are two things very prominent, science and industrialization. And this is a very, very pervasive consciousness which is spread all over the world. It may have begun in Europe, uh, gone to the United States, but now we see it even in India, this per perspective of life, that life must be understood scientifically and it must be lived industrially. And here we have our Acharya, Albert Einstein, and Henry Ford. Okay. So we're going to look a little bit, uh, very briefly, of the, the history of how this attitude developed. You know, this kind of look at, look at life, this scientific look at life, and give a little bit of an example of how we've been able to introduce these principles into this environment. One, one particular environment where we try to disseminate the message of the Bhagavatam. So if you look at America, uh, all the way back to the transcendentalists, Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, Henry David Thoreau, Walt Whitman, they all had contact with this philosophy, this culture. Emerson, if you haven't read it, has a very beautiful poem about the Gita, very nice poem like that and so on. And then of course, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, he brought the Srimad Bhagavatam. He published it, he translated it, he disseminated it. And through his institution, I don't know how many now, hundreds of thousands of copies of Srimad Bhagavatam in this tradition you know, have been distributed. So very, very strong uh, presentation, July 1966. So there's some history in the West, like that, okay. And he, in turn, uh, inspired his disciples to try and present this message in this more scientific, industrialized uh, area. One of those was specifically Dr. T.D. Singh, who was from Manipur. And coming from Manipur, of course, is a very rich tradition of this whole Gaudiya Vaishnava uh, idea. And he was initiated as B.S. Damodar Swami. And I was uh, working with them from about 1984 until about 1996. And we organized successful programs, uh, first and second world congress on the synthesis of science and religion. Then we had a uh, first international seminar on the study of consciousness within science. And these were very groundbreaking programs. There really had been nobody before this time who had actually talked about consciousness within science to this level like that. We were challenged by, challenged by the University of Arizona. They had a program about four, four years later and called it the first international seminar also. And we challenged them and they, they took, took it off and said, yes, it's not the first. You've done a successful program. So very, very powerful programs. And they were very uh, well received. Uh, great participation. For example, George Wald, he got his Nobel Prize in chemistry. Charles Towns got a Nobel Prize in physics. Do you know what he got the Nobel Prize for? The laser. <laughs> The laser. And then Dalai Lama, Dalai Lama, Nobel Prize in Peace. And these are just a few of the examples of the response that when the Bhagavad principles are put into the proper language, they can be understood you know, from this perspective. These very, very great respected, respected acharyas within this community, except that there's some idea here. Of course, I can go into great detail, but you know. I've already gone through eight minutes and 39 seconds. <laughs> okay. So, of course, the entire history of science, how we have this scientific point of view, this scientific look at things, 
this scientific look at the Srimad Bhagavatam. It's very, very extensive, many, many books on this. In a very brief summary, maybe you know this, we, can, we may go back to the Socratic method to Socrates, which pl passes on to Plato, Aristotle, of course, who's tremendous father of, of Western science. And then it was lost to Western culture until pretty much the time of St. Bonaventura and Thomas Aquinas. And Thomas Aquinas was able to get in contact with Aristotle's idea through Arabic translations. And he said, this is the way to, to integrate the rational method and the religious method. You know, we'll take the Aristotle's ideas and then we can explain this religious tradition uh, very well. And the Pope formally uh, certified this. In all of our churches, all of our monasteries, uh, the ideas of St. Thomas Aquinas will be the official standard of how we will explain you know, religion, Bhagavad Dharma. St. Bonaventura took his doctorate at the same time, and he was much more synthetic. Uh, give, the, give the rabbit carrots, you know, have a relationship with the rabbit. That's how we'll understand the rabbit. But Aristotle's idea, the idea of Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas was first, first you cut the ears off the rabbit, then you take his eyes out, then you take his teeth out, then you take his heart out, and now we understand the rabbit. <laughs> Yeah, synthetic, analytic, the winner, <laughs> okay? So our science, our perspective is to analyze everything, break it up into machines, then we know. This, of course, comes down to Sir Isaac Newton, one of the grandest acharyas in our Western knowledge, then Einstein and his cohorts, and again, we're taking it on down to the modern world with Charles Towns. So there's a whole history of how this Western modern world looks at things, you know. And of course, we can take also look at Canada in terms of atomism and Democritus going to Greece and then coming in also here too. So, there's a history. Okay. Ooh. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, two, two principles are very prominent in this, in, in my experience in actually trying to communicate what we're talking about. Uh, first one is that the Occidental model of reality, who we are, is bottom-up. There was a big battle at the time of Paracelsus, Magnus, about whether alchemy would be the basic science or whether uh, uh, mechanical philosophy, physics, was the real way to understand nature. And alchemy lost, alchemy lost, so physics has become our normative science. If you want to understand something, you've got to be able to go back and explain it in terms of physics. Then after that, uh, chemistry has to base itself upon physics. What is the most scientific definition of water? Huh? Huh? Dihydrous oxide, <laughs> yeah, so same way. If you want, chemistry has to show what it's discovering in terms of physics. Then after that, we get biology. If I discover some medicine, some plant, some herb, right? The, the, in America, the Food and Drug Administration will not let you release it until you know the chemical formula. You have to know that before, the, before we know what this thing is, we have to know the chemical formula. The chemical formula is explained in terms of the com atomic composition. And once we have biology, then we can go into axon, dendrites, neurons, and we can get psychiatry. And of course, we all know that the brain is produced from the mind, or the mind is produced from the brain. So psychiatry then, of course, tries to explain all the psychological functions, memory, alcoholism, homosexuality, all these things are being explained in terms of psychiatry. And then once in America, once we have the individual with his mind, we get sociology, the society. And finally, society produces God. <laughs> yes. Somebody, one of my, my friend, Dr. Samaresh Bandapajai, showed me an article by an Indian uh, philosopher who was an uh, evolutionist. He believed that everything was produced by evolution from, from matter. And his conclusion that the highest production of this whole process the highest production of evolution was 
the Srimad Bhagavatam. Isn't evolution wonderful? It has evolved the Srimad Bhagavatam. And that was his idea, okay. So, different people have different ideas. But definitely this is the idea in the West, bottom up. So if we're going to explain this, we have to make it clear that the Bhagavat model is the opposite, top down. First, there's Peter Pan, the Adi Purusha, Govinda, playing with his friends, having his, his Madhurya Ras with Wendy and different things like this, okay. Then the, the material world, which basically is a prison, it's not for nice people. This explains a lot, you know. We weren't born to be happy. We're born to do tapasya for purification. And then we get the Purusha avatars who deal just with this little part of the whole picture. Then specifically we come more into the level, which Bhagavad Gita 7.4 is the basic kernel of all this, which is expanded in the Bhagavatam. It doesn't deviate from this. Bhumir apo in the low vayu kamano buddha eva cha ahankara etiyame binya prakritirashtada. So in the second canto, Brahma explains this to Narada. In the third canto, uh, Brahma explains it, goes on explaining it to more, to somebody, to uh, Vidura. Vidura hears it from Maitreya. And Kapila explains it to his mother. But it's the same basic ontology, same principles. These, the living entity first acquires his subtle elements. The ahankara, which makes us I feel we have a separate existence from God. The booty, the subconscious, or the intelligence, which gives us our attitude. We can have an attitude of Ishwara hum, aham bogi, siddham balavan suki. <laughs> I'm powerful, I'm the controller. Or else we can have another attitude that because I'm occupying space in this world, I have a debt to others. So this is the booty, the attitude, the subconscious, usually subconscious. And then Manas then actually thinks on that basis. We all have a body of intelligence, we all have a body of thoughts, we all have a body of abilities. At the time of death, time of death, we leave this gross body and then travel to a new body with these things with us. The gross body then, of course, the first element which covers the soul is manas, I'm sorry, space. Every body occupies space. Right now, if you're touching, touching somebody else, raise your hand. Anybody here touching anybody else? It has to be two people. Nobody's touching anybody else right now. How amazing, everybody keeps space. If this was a traditional Arabic culture, everybody, you would have to be close enough to people when you're talking to them to feel their breath on your face, to feel the breath on the face. You know. We have developed this occidental British space of don't touch, keep some distance. This is my background in psychology. And there are many incredible studies in cross-cultural studies of space perception. And it's extremely different how different cultures organize space in terms of motion, in terms of speed, everything else. So this is created, and we're not conscious of this usually. We're not conscious of how we're creating space, organizing it. Different cultures see, experience a different world than we're seeing right now. They can walk 10 stories off the ground on metal girders this wide, like we walk across the street with no fear or anything else. Their whole perceptual apparatus is different. They experience a different world, okay? So space, and different species have different combinations. Bhutas, Pretas, Kushmandas, Vinayakas, Rakshashas, Yakshashas. Different combinations of these elements make up the body. Then a, a portion of the space becomes tactile experience, prana. A portion of that develops color. And then we get our scientific bias, very much visual. Science, modern science is very visually biased in uh, taste and funny smell. My time is short, so I won't go in detail, <laughs> but there's tremendous scope for communicating on this level, on this level of these, of these elements and the different subtle elements like that and the literature available, okay? You see a cube, right? The cream colored plane, is it in the front or the back? Scientists, look at the point in the center and move your head backwards and forwards. Like that. Look at the point, and move your head backwards and forwards. What happens? It moves, right? Yeah, is it an illusion or reality? Yeah. Science is a rational experience, empiricism. 
So things like this, there's so much scope in this area for Sankhya, to bring people from the, the visual elements to the subtler elements, and then finally to the psychological elements, and then to the Atma, and what is the character of the Atma, Chaitanya Charitamrita, okay? Time, okay, I'm running out of time, I have six minutes. <laughs> we Indians have the best mythology in the world. Actually, there never was Sri Ram, Ayodhya, or Treta Yuga. These are all stories given to us to edify to edify our consciousness. No, we're accepting this. There are these four ages, and these things have changed over time. There is a Kali Yuga, there was a Ram, he lived for I don't know how many years, 10,000 years. So can we actually accept this? Yeah. If you actually look at, uh, to our, our, to our time standard is German. Time is a line that goes one direction, there are no branches, and every step is just the same. Yeah. But if you look at other cultures, cross-cultural views of time, very different views of time that are quite practical. Yeah. I can't go into much detail, but Devahuti mentions this fact. Uh, Kapila says to Devahuti, uh, he said, time is the external manifestation of the Paramatma, the Paramatma, the super, super soul. He tells her, I keep myself within as the Paramatma, but those who look externally experience me as time. So if someone tells you, asks you, do you have any time to kill? That's your relationship with the Paramatma. Somebody else, time, every time is very precious, every moment. Of course, in Vedic culture, so much we see time as cyclic. The heart is cyclic, the intestines are cyclic, the days are cyclic. So it's not a matter of doing it one time, it's also a possibility of doing it over and over and over again and it becomes much more iconographic. You know, the present moment, who knows how many times we'll meet again. If you're gonna actually present this and argue with linear time, with iso isomorphic space and time, then you have to take on carbon dating. <laughs> carbon dating is one of the strongest elements used to establish this linear time, time feature. And of course, there's no time to go into it, but even if you look at the, the uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, you'll see incredible, incredible holes in the whole carbon dating system like that and so on for establishing what is reality, for establishing there was no Treta Yuga, there was no Dwarpara Yuga, but there are many, many holes in this whole uh, scientific system. And our point is that yes, these things did exist, you know, in different times and different cultures, different subtle levels of consciousness. Okay, uh, there are many, many citations uh, Quantum Questions by Ken Wilber is just full of beautiful citations from scientists which give uh, access to the Bhagavatam. Einstein, de Broglie, uh, Max Planck, Werner Heisenberg, Arthur Eddington, like that. Yeah. And what we're doing ourselves, we've been going on from these works with these Nobel laureates, and most recently what we organized, our organization is NEOS, North American Institute, for Oriental and Classical Studies. And, and, and we just organized a program with the National Library in Peru that was overwhelmingly successful. Five universities want us to repeat it again, again this year. Uh, Jesuits, head of the Psychiatric Association, founders of the Philemon Foundation, so many very, very nice scholars and everybody else were able to get together on this level of psychology and the sacred. And myself, what I've uh, most focused in on is Carl Jung and Jungian psychology. It's very active. The Phil Philemon Foundation at the University of London is publishing new, very interesting books on Jung's work. And so he becomes an extremely excellent resource for, for crossing over to the Bhagavatam's perspective like that and so on. So we're doing that. Anybody wants to talk to us, we have publications and so on. Okay. And for those who actually come to appreciating this level, then the next level is Gandharva Veda, you know. Uh, on the one side is uh, drama theory going through Aristotle, Konstantin Stanislavski, Viola Spolin, and that's how we develop it in the West. But in the East, of course, we have Bharata Muni, Abhinava Gupta, Emperor Boja, and the Rup Rupa Goswami with Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, on down to David Haberman, like that. And this contrast then takes us to the level of rasa. 
the Jivera Swarupoi, Jivera Jivera Swarupoi, the accent, Nichera Krishna Das, that the ultimate nature of the of the Atma is to experience this rasa in relationship to Krishna, and of course we're promoting through our our tradition, Srimad Bhagavatam, through Rupa Goswami, yeah, is the way to appreciate it. And this again can be crossed over very, very successfully uh, to the Western tradition through their drama theory, like that improvisational theater, like that. Okay. Uh, then we don't have time, but then the Bhagavatam itself is extremely organized in terms of its production like that. I'll go quickly here, okay. We have 12 cantos in the Bhagavatam. First is the Lotus Feet of Krishna, a very, very good introduction. Who's speaking? What are his qualifications? Who's the, the listener? What are his qualifications? What is the purpose of the book? Under what circumstances was it produced? Okay. Uh, after that, it goes through a series of Manus based upon their, their background. Then, of course, we take a break in our Manu and discuss uh, oh, Krishna's pastimes. Then we go back to the, uh, the Manu after Krishna's pastimes, and then there's a summary with epilogue like that. So to the scientific mind, it's an extremely organized book like that. In the Manu section, uh, three through, we got here, three through seven is all the daughter, children of Swayam Bhuva Manu. Dap up, Devahuti Ga Kuti Prasuti Uttanapada. Then he asks, what about the other Manus? So Canto eight is then the other Manus and all of their incarnations. Then Canto nine is our Manu. So it's extremely organized it's in terms of the manus one after another, and you can understand it in terms of making a little machine out of it like that and so on. Okay. Shimar Bhagavatam is a literary incarnation of God. Shri Krishna Bhagavan ki. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much. 20, 26 minutes, 22 seconds. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Any questions mm -hmm. or discussion? Microphone is coming. Okay. Uh, you spoke about the science and Bhagavatam, the interplay In between the minutes. both. <laughs> yeah. I would like to submit. It is just a comment, no question. Everything, even starting from Aristotle, Aristotle says that metaphysics is different from physics. Physics, he meant science. And coming to Wittgenstein, person of our times, Wittgenstein, a German thinker, he says, uh, everything that is not science, like ethics and religion, have relevance, even though they cannot be proved scientifically and constructed logically. Therefore, you know, Swamiji, we don't have to see everything from the angle of science. Everything need not be seen from the angle of science yes, yes. to say they are true and relevant. Yes. Relevant. Thank you. Yeah. No, the, the, um, Einstein, no, Newton, Sir Isaac, he's considered the, the greatest scientist who ever lived. He invented the, the law, he discovered the laws of gravity, the laws of optics, the laws of mechanics, calculus. He did this all from the age of 18 to 21 years old. Before he, before he was studying theology, afterwards he was studying theology. He wrote over 100,000 words on theology. They asked him, why did you take time off from theology to, to study science? He said, I didn't take time off. He said, there are two books for understanding God, the Bible and nature where God is writing with his own hand. But he said, you cannot come to a firm conclusion just by studying it through science. You have to have scriptural authority. The same point. I, I, one more point. Einstein said, science can tell us how things are, but it cannot tell us how they should be. Same point. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. One profound implication of your engagement is that how do we understand different traditions, like Western traditions? So looking at uh, Einstein as an Acharya, for example, this language. But one challenge here is 
that what is the mode of engagement? I think your last uh, engagement with Gandharva Veda, with aesthetics from Bharata Muni to, uh, you know, Hardiman on the one hand and Aristotle to Bia Spolin. So when we are doing such a comparative engagement, what is the nature of comparison? For example, is it a comparison from one standpoint or there is a kind of simultaneous engagement where there is a possibility of a mutual critic. So one is not just looking at uh, Aristotle from Bharata Muni, but how does one, so therefore what is the methodology and modality of comparison, which though it comes from one tradition, but it tries to, you know, a, be a methodology of simultaneous engagement, and in this, in what way Bhagavata, as a, a Bhagavata mind, can help us be in a different modality of comparison, which is not just a comparison, but a comparison of comparison. <laughs> I, I, as I understand your question, it would take maybe half an hour to answer perspective. Um, boy, where to start? I got time is short too. Uh, because the Bhagavata, I, 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 received, I received it from one, one tradition. Of course, I'm reading other literature, other things, so many things, you know. But I received it from Rupa Goswami's tradition, right, through A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. But I, I'm seeing that's just one little perspective on the Bhagavat. I don't know if we deny that, so on, you know. And so then the next point is how to realize it. So our, our perspective would be that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's path is Gandharva Veda. Singing, dancing, and drama. All of Rupa Goswami's terminology in Bhakti Rasamita Sindhu is all drama terminology. Vibhava, Anubhava, Sattvika Bhava, Stai Bhava, Vyabhichari Bhava. It's all realizing it through Gandharva Veda as opposed to uh, Vastu Veda, Ayurveda, different ways. Okay. So once you kind of take the fruit as being valuable, then you can look at the drama tradition. Okay, we're using a drama tradition, and people are over here, and you say, you know, we're trying to communicate something to you. Then if you look at the drama tradition in the West, from Aristotle to Konstantin Stanislavski, you know, who's very powerful in terms of Western drama, then on down to Viola Spolin and the improvisational theater traditions, all of the things we see now with James Bond and all these things are all coming pretty much. The actors are trained and the directors are using these techniques to communicate their perspective. Uh, yeah, the icon, the iconic communication. So that's my, my point is that, is that if you're trained in either, either tradition, you're coming to the same conclusion. And then you look across and you see, ah, the same things are going on. Uh, a sannyasi is supposed to serve God with his uh, words, uh, body, words and mind. You look at Viola Spolin, she says, an actor does his job with his body, words, and mind. So the realization should be the same. And you look at what she's talking about, for her, the ultimate, ultimate realization for her is the environment with a big E, a capital E. And she knows it. Carl Jung knew these things. They were direct ex directly experiencing this thing. So I would say that her, her level of realization is coming to this level of paramatma gyan, all pervasive, the hand of God, we're not sure what's connected to the arm. And so both traditions, they, when, when two thieves meet upon the road, they need no introduction. They know each other by sight. Yeah. So same way, theater from both sides, you realize you're using the same techniques, the psychological techniques, and either side then you can start to communicate and transfer what, what, what your realization is. But the, but the drama of the Bhagavatam then goes all the way to the to bhava and everything else in a subtle sense, which Western drama, they can reach out from the Paramatma level, but they can't reach out from the Bhagavan level, unless maybe we go back to the, uh, the drama within the Christian church and that tradition, which is there, and so on. Yeah. Okay? Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. I think we'll need to close, close this session. We have one more uh, uh, special presentation. Thank you very much. Thomas Taylor. 
So he is a teacher and researcher in Sanskrit at the Australian National University in Canberra. Um, he, his research explores the intersection of contemporary critical theory and Sanskrit narrative literature. He's the author of The Fall of the Indigo Jackal and his most recent book called The Seven Days of Nectar, Contemporary Oral Performance of the Bhagavata Purana. And he'll be drawing on his recent book in his presentation today. So we welcome him by a, via video. Um, uh, McComas sends his apologies. Uh, he had to have knee surgery. Uh, doctors said couldn't travel. He sent a recorded video, 22 minutes long, with his presentation. And, <coughs> excuse me, right after that, he's online to answer a couple of questions for about five minutes. So he's waiting to, for the conversation, assuming everything goes well here. So. Oh, and he asked me to mention apologies because he uses the word adhyayana in his presentation, recorded one. He means adhyapana for those of us who are keeping track. Namo Namaha, Sarve Vyaha, Mitre Vyaha, Sadaram Namo Namaha. My name is McComas. I'm very sorry that I'm not there with you in person in Chennai. My surgeon, for some ridiculously small operation, won't let me on a plane for four weeks. So I'm very sorry. It's a video presentation. Thank you particularly to uh, Ravi and Kenneth for showing this flexibility. But I'm very sorry I'm not there to share this event with you all. I'd like to start with two caveats, please. My first caveat is that, of course, the Bhagavata Purana is a text that we all know and love on a spiritual level, a, a visceral level. And to treat this text as uh, like any other text, like a scholarly uh, object or an object worthy of scholarly, scholarly investigation and consideration, uh, makes, I think, most of us feel a little bit uncomfortable. So I'm actually uh, crossing two sides of my life, a spiritual interest in this text and a scholarly interest in this text. I'm not particularly comfortable with, uh, with uh, this crossover, and I beg your forgiveness or understanding. Secondly, there's a funny English expression that you might know. It's called it's uh, teaching your grandmother to suck eggs. Uh, translated into Sanskrit, of course, this is gurave amra bhakshana adhyayanam. It's teaching your guru how to eat a mango. I'm very nervous that I will be teaching my, my gurus how to eat mangoes in this talk because I know there are some people in this audience who've had far more experience with this text and with this practice of Bhagavata Sabdaha than I myself have had. So again, please, doshaha kshantavyaha. May all my sins be forgiven. Now, Indians do tents. They build tents bigger and better than anybody else in the world. I have seen tents that stretch back as far as the eye can see, filled with people, tens of thousands of people, who are absolutely focused on the speaker on the stage. The speaker on the stage is telling stories from Bhagavata Purana. What is it that holds these vast audiences in thrall to these speakers? What's going on here? What is this practice and what's it all about? So very briefly, uh, Bhagavata Purana, uh, the Bhagavata Saptaham is a seven day practice in which a, a Vakta, a Vyas, a speaker, an exponent, uh, invited by a pious family or a temple community will come either to uh, somebody's house, uh, a village hall, uh, a temple hall, a hall attached to a temple, uh, a sports ground, an arena, a vast tent, a marquee, a pandal set up on fallow land and over the process of seven days the, uh, the speaker will uh, based on uh, narratives of Bhagavata Purana, will hold his or her audience in thrall. Now, the speaker will uh, be using verses from Bhagavata Puranam, uh, 
perhaps as few as five or six in an hour, perhaps as many as 40 an hour, and the speaker will cantillate these verses. Cantillate is a lovely word. You don't hear this word very often. It's somewhere halfway between chant and sing. The speaker will cantillate verses from the original text. Of course, these are in Sanskrit. And of course, Sanskrit is unknown or not readily intelligible to the vast majority of people in the audience. Therefore, the speaker will expound upon those verses in Sanskrit in uh, the local language, whatever that is. So in northern India, the, the speaker will be speaking in Sanskrit. Uh, oh, stupid name. The speaker will be speaking in Hindi, uh, in southern India, in southern languages, and of course in the diasporic community, quite often these performances are now given in English as well. The practice of Bhagavata Saptaha is growing by the year. Every time I come back to India, these performances are bigger, brasher, more expensive, more luxurious, louder, noisier than in the preceding year. They have really exploded from being small family-based events to being mega events with, as I say, tens of thousands of participants. And of course, they are podcast, they are broadcast live on television, and so the audience is now reaching out to millions of people all over the world. This practice is growing rapidly. Now, this talk is really about the factors that enable uh, or encourage or explain this growth. Now, of course, there are many external factors. Since 1991, we've seen uh, a great increase in the wealth, prosperity of the Indian middle class. And the middle class chooses to invest much of its uh, excess wealth, its surplus wealth, in religious expression. So pilgrimage has grown very rapidly. Donations to, um, to worthy foundations uh, has, have grown very rapidly. Uh, support for gurus, support for swamis has grown very rapidly. And this is yet another form of conspicuous religious consumption that has grown very rapidly, particularly since uh, the economic reforms of 1991. Uh, there's also a political side to this where I think a more assertive form of uh, Hindu public expression uh, has become much more common in the last decades. So an, an, upwilling, uh, an upwelling of, uh, uh, of Hindu pride, uh, uh, Hindu assertiveness in the public space. These are the external factors. In this talk, I'm actually more interested in the internal factors. Uh, what is it that makes people come back? What is it that holds people? What is it that holds people's attention? Not just for one day or two days, but for seven days of these events. What are the sources of authenticity? I argue that these events are only going to attract and maintain their audiences if those audiences experience these events as authentic. What are the sources of authenticity? In this little talk, I'm going to look at five sources of authenticity. The first one is the potency of the oral tradition. So this is a very common uh, theme or common uh, shared phenomenon among various Indic traditions. The potency of Indic authority is, of course, paramount in, in Buddhist traditions, paramount in Jaina traditions, but of course, very important in Hindu traditions. So. Those of us who grew up in the West are used to the idea of text as being powerful insofar as it is a book. You can go out and buy a book and benefit from your own private reading of that book. In Indic traditions, this is largely not the case. To benefit from uh, a text, one needs to receive it through uh, an authorised, validated, uh, experienced teacher, a guru, a swami. And for the guru himself to be uh, uh, fully authentic and uh, uh, verified, as it were, he needs to come through a sampradaya, that is, uh, a, a lineage of guru and a guru and teacher, a uh, parampara. The parampara, the, the lineage, the sampradaya of the exponents in these practices is very important. 
you can't just walk in and off the street and become a Vakdar yourself. Maybe you can, but it's going to be hard to get established. The events that I've uh, taken part in myself and uh, the speakers with whom I've spoken uh, often make very clear what their lineage is. And uh, so not only are references directly made to their own gurus during these performances, of course the uh, images of their gurus will be placed on the um, stage at the front of these performances. Uh, prayers to the gurus, of course, are very much integral to the practice. And, uh, and the speakers will relate stories that they have heard from their guru or tell stories about their gurus. So all the time we are very conscious of the speaker's lineage, of the speaker as being a member of an authenticated parampara in a particular sampradaya. Now, uh, that's one aspect. So, so the authentic authenticity of the guru's lineage is tied up with the potency of the oral tradition. Now, the second thing I want to talk about brief, briefly is uh, the qualities of the speaker himself. Now, I'm going to use the masculine here. How many female speakers are there out there? Well, I know of two, but there are thousands of male speakers. So if you will forgive me, I'll talk about the speakers as being he, but I will accept the fact that, yes, there are indeed uh, female speakers out there as well. Could McComas Taylor walk in off the street and give a Bhagavata Saptaham? The answer is no. Our audiences demand authenticity from their speakers. They are looking at their speakers' own qualities. They expect their speakers to have experienced if not divine inspiration, then certainly something very close to it. The speakers are expected to speak from the heart. They are expected to speak from direct personal experience of deep spiritual engagement with this text. Uh, speakers will rejoice during their performances. Of course, I feel bad calling these performances, but we need to use this word, uh, pravachana. Speakers are engaged very deeply with this text during their uh, time on stage and of course their audiences also react very strongly to these speakers' uh, emotions. So uh, a, a speaker will weep uh, during uh, Krishna's departure from, uh, from his home village setting out to Mathura. Uh, as the speaker weeps, so too the audience weeps as well. So it's the authentic, uh, deep personal experience as expressed by the speaker himself is a, an important source of authenticity in the experience of the performance for the audiences as well. These speakers are extraordinary individuals. They are able to speak for four, three to four hours a day, maybe with a little break in the middle, for seven days in a row without repeating themselves, largely without notes, often extemporizing. Uh, and to be able, uh, of course, they can sing, they can cantillate, they can tell funny stories, they hold the audience in the palms of their hands. They are masterly performances, uh, masterly performers, these speakers. Uh, they're, they're an extraordinary group of individuals uh, with uh, varying depths of. Uh, knowledge of Sanskrit grammar, varying depths of uh, access to the actual uh, uh, grammar of the text themselves. But what they, what they have exhibited uh, unfailingly, in my experience, is uh, a, a spiritual, uh, religious engagement with the text, which they are then able to communicate easily with their audiences. So, personal qualities of the speaker. That's my, th my second point. Now, my third point in uh, this search for the sources of authenticity is the role of Sanskrit verses. What role do Sanskrit verses play in Bhagavata Saptaham? Is it possible to have a Bhagavata Saptaham without any Sanskrit verses? Well, yes, it is possible, but it wouldn't be the same thing, and I don't think I've ever heard of one. When you speak to uh, members of audiences about the role of the Sanskrit verses, they say things like this. Without the Sanskrit verses, it'd be just like reading a book. They say things like, 
The Sanskrit verses are what gives the performance its rasa, its flavour, its essence. Now, a lot of the use of the, Span the Sanskrit verses in a text, as I said earlier, that there'll be between 4, 10, 15, maybe as many as 20 or 30, uh, up to 40 Sanskrit verses per hour, uh, plus the, uh, a vernacular commentary. I argue that uh, the Sanskrit verses serve to tie the speaker's spoken discourse into the authority of the root text, of the root of the written text. So when the speaker includes a Sanskrit verse in his, his um, uh, spoken text, that's his way of tying his discourse back to the authority of uh, the root text. Again, uh, this will sound cynical, and I'm, I hope you don't find, find anyone finds this hurtful, but it is also a way that the speaker is able to display or perform his scholarship. Now, whether he does this intentionally, I'm not prepared to say, but I know the effect on the audience is that if a, if a, if a performer uses many Sanskrit verses, then it is clear to the audience that he is a scholar and he has a deep engagement with that text. Is this performance, is this use of Sanskrit verses in any way cynical or manipulative? I don't believe it is, but the effect certainly on the audience is thus. It demonstrates the scholarship, uh, the punditry, if you will, of the speaker. Now, uh, it's also an interesting fact that the, speak that the audiences themselves generally don't understand, understand very much Sanskrit. So, uh, the more common verses, the more popular ones, of course, everybody knows, you know, yada, yada, hi, dharmasya, all this sort of stuff. But uh, the more esoteric verses from Bhagavata, uh, from uh, Bhagavata Purana, uh, are largely not understood by people in the audience. So, this is an interesting point. These verses have an effect on the audience, but they are not understood at a semantic level as ordinary speech, as I'm addressing you now. Uh, a theoretician, J.L. Austin, from many years ago, talked about perlocutionary speech acts. This is where a speech act causes and or has an effect uh, or acquires some meaning other than that which is implied by the words. And I've argued in my writing elsewhere that uh, the role of Sanskrit verses in these, um, in these events is largely as perlocutionary speech acts. That is, they have an impact, they have an effect, they cause a change. That is not happening at a semantic level. It's not happening at the language of meaning, at the level of meaning, because uh, People in the audience don't understand the Sanskrit. So, the role of Sanskrit verses, I argue, in the creation of authenticity on the part of the audience is important. Sanskrit verses need to be there. So, my fourth, my fourth source of authenticity here is Shabda Brahman. Now, Shabda Brahman, a Sanskrit term, Shabda, you know, means speech or sound or word, Brahman, means Brahman. Brahman means the ineffable absolute. Now, some people translate this as uh, God in speech or the divine in the form of words. It's hard to translate. I, I rather explain it than translate it. And I would say that Shabda Brahman is the power, the transcendental, of, uh, the transcendental power of sound to cause transformation. The power of words to induce uh, religious or spiritual transformation. Shabda Brahman is a very old and deep Indic tradition. Uh, it runs uh, closely tied to the idea of, uh, of uh, oral authority and uh, closely tied to the idea of Parampara and Sampradaya. It runs through uh, Hinduism as well as uh, uh, Buddhism as well as Hinduism and it's a very deeply held belief. People who attend these verses, uh, these uh, events firmly believe 
that the Sanskrit verses are able to touch their hearts in a particular way and induce a particular uh, state of uh, religious appreciation, a heightened state of religious experience. Often this effect is described in terms of vibrations. Now this is a, a Western scientific term. It has no uh, equivalent in, uh, in Indic languages. Now I know that people use Spanda, but that's actually rather different. This seems to me to be an imported uh, Western explanation uh, for, for Shabda Brahman, and I'm not particularly enamoured of this myself. I'm actually criticised about my approach to Shabda Brahman. It is real for many, many people in the audience. You know that these people are being touched, they are being affected. Now, is it real for natural physical reasons, or are people socialised into this tradition? Well, I can prove you have to be socialised into it because I've been at Sapta events where Australians, Anglo-Australians have walked in off the street, they have heard the sound and they've turned round and walked out again. They have not experienced Shabda Brahman. To experience Shabda Brahman, you have to be socialised into this tradition. Then it may or may not be a physical effect that needs further research. Friends, my 20 minutes is now up. I wanted also to talk about two more uh, aspects. One is the aspect of satsang and darshan. So the idea that you are in a community that experiences this together. This, is, this can be a very powerful source of authenticity. Of course, Diana Eck has written uh, very eloquently on the, the subject of darshan as well. The fact that you are uh, receiving darshan of the speaker, you're receiving darshan of the text and any images that are there as well. The fact that you are together in satsang, which is transformative in itself, and I think is also explicable in terms of uh, Victor Turner's ideas of communitas. So those were my six sources of authenticity. Uh, just looking at them again, the potency of oral tradition, uh, the personal qualities of the speaker himself, uh, the role of Sanskrit verses, the role of Shapta Brahman, the transformative power of speech, uh, satsang and darshan I'm taking together, and communitas. I'm sorry I didn't talk about those two in detail. Friends, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I sure this conference will be a great success. I'm very, very sorry I'm not there to enjoy it with you. Tanyavadaha punar darshanaya. Namo namaha tripyaha sadaram. Hello, Professor Taylor. Thank you so much for a fascinating presentation. We're now going to have a couple of minutes for discussion. Can you hear? I'm sorry, I can't really hear you. More? Okay. Now can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes? Uh, yeah, just, just. Professor Taylor, can you hear me now? Ah, uh, yes, that's Barbara, isn't it? Yes, uh, yes. All right. Yeah, beautifully clear. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for a fascinating presentation. We're looking forward to a discussion now. There will be time for just a few questions. Thank you. You mentioned Sabda Brahma. Is it a kind of meditation using certain sounds, repeating the same sounds again and again? Are you mentioning Is it so? Uh, I, excuse me, Barbara, I'll have to ask you to repeat the question. Yes, he didn't get the question. Yes, if I can repeat the question, but I'm not sure I heard the, got the question either. Yes, so could you, the question is, do you, do you view this as a type of meditation? Do you think the people who are experiencing this are experiencing it as a kind of type of meditative experience? 
I, I think that's a really good question, and I think for me, the, the answer would be yes. Uh, it's a uh, time for many of us to engage, and I think indeed the response to uh, part of it is uh, how many people did it here meditation. I would like to confirm what you said about the transformative effect of sound from what I have heard from people in the West, especially from very elderly people who used to hear the Mass, the Eucharistic service in English, but the prayers and so on were in Latin. And they did not understand the Latin because they were not priests who were educated in the study of Latin. But they often told me, when I was studying there at Harvard, I was a young priest then, that somehow the English mass, even the readings which were in English, but the prayers were not in English, in all Latin, somehow the full English mass did not touch them. But they said in those good old days, when things were in Latin, somehow we were lifted up. And so I'd like to confirm that this is not just in the East, but also in the West. Uh, yes, I think I've got the gist of your question. Uh, so the role of Latin in the Catholic Mass, uh, even though people don't understand it, at a, uh, uh, at a linguistic level, uh, still is a deep uh, emotional and uh, spiritual response. And I think this is well documented. Many people would, I, I personally know very little of it, but uh, I, I understand this is widely accepted. Uh, but I would argue that this is socially conditioned. I don't think uh, for a person who's not grown up in this tradition, uh, understood neither the English nor the, nor the Latin. Uh, would they experience this? Uh, I doubt it. And I get that Shabda Brahman, why it's very, very powerful for people who have grown up within this tradition, uh, this is to a large extent a uh, unit socialized into this. And I, I can't remember now if I mentioned in my little talk that uh, I've seen uh, uh, non devotees walk into these events up and out, untouched by the sound, because they don't have the social and cultural background. And I feel uh, that the same thing would probably have in that mass. Thank you, Professor Taylor. I think we, because of the time, we're going to have to bring this to conclusion, but we missed having you here, but we loved your presentation and look forward to seeing you at another conference. Thank Okay, thank you so much for having me, and I'd like to say a special thanks to Bobby and Kenneth for accommodating me, and uh, hello to my friends, and goodbye to my sister. Thank you. Thank you, sir. On behalf of the organizers, I thank all the speakers and the chairpersons of the morning sessions. Now we break for lunch. Uh, Everybody occupy these seats, his or her seats. This is a very important session. This is on aesthetics. Aesthetics. Namaskar. Aesthetics in uh, connection with the. The philosophy of uh, uh, Bhagavad Purana is a very important subject. 
because uh, there are certain rasas which are not recognized by Bharata, for example, bhakti, which is recognized much later by the Goswamins, the followers of Chaitanya. So we would discuss uh, different aspects of rasa here, how many rasas were there originally at the time of Bharata and how uh, they were in the number of uh, those rasas were increased and uh, under what arguments. Uh, I have uh, the honor to invite first Professor Graham Schweig of Christopher Newport University and he would speak on the ubiquity and scarcity of prema, a constructivist comparative analysis of purest love in the Bhagavata Purana and Chaitanya theology. I give you also a, a short introduction of uh, the speaker today. The first speaker, Professor Graham Schweig is Professor of Religion and former inaugural director of the Asian Studies program at Christopher Newport University. He is a regularly invited lecturer at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C and was lecturer at Duke University and later visiting associate professor of Sanskrit at the University of Virginia. He earned his doctorate in comparative religion from Harvard University and has contributed articles to numerous journals and books in the field. His books are Dance of Divine Love, India's Classical Sacred Love Story, The Rasa Leela of Krishna, Bhagavad Gita, The Beloved Lord's Secret Love Song and a Living Theology of Krishna Bhakti, Essential Teachings of A.C. Bhakti Vedant, Swami Prabhupada, etc., etc. So a few are perhaps uh, uh, still remain to be mentioned. So I uh, now request Professor Shwai kindly to come forward at the dais and uh, start his exposition. Thank you. Um, and I'm amazed you pronounced my last name correctly. I very much appreciate that. When I lived in Bangalore many years ago, my driver called me Swagji. So I went from Schweig to Swagji. I'd like to also thank the uh, organizers of this conference and the many institutions involved, which I won't again repeat here, but very appreciative. Now, when I was invited to present a paper at this conference, about 12 or 14 different topics came to mind. But I decided to expand on a footnote, footnote number 20 on page 169 of a book I wrote 12 years ago. Something has been sort of gnawing away at me. And basically, this topic is an expansion of that, that footnote. Um, Okay, um, I stayed, and I'm going, this is a work in progress, um, but I, I want to just reflect on, a, on a, a journal article I read many years ago by Klaus Klostermeyer, a, an article called Hridaya Vidya. And in that article, he insists that the Chaitanya school of bhakti da, uh, articulates in the most sophisticated way the nature of love of God in Hindu traditions. So that's quite a, it's quite a statement. And, um, and here, I'm really looking at that love of God, the, the nature of that love of God, or prema. Now, in that book I wrote 12 years ago, Dance of Divine Love, I examine the many words that are used to express love and the varieties of love, the nuances of love. So, but it's, it's on prema that I wish to focus here. Uh, is there a problem? No. Oh. Okay. Um, so, um, it's indisputably the case that the leading theologians under Chaitanya, known as the six Goswamins in Vrindavan, established the, the Bhagavata as the very foundational text on which its original theology was most dependent and from which its original theology was drawn and constructed. 
I found in that footnote many years ago that the Bhagavata's employment of the word prema and related words derivative from its original verbal root form, on the one hand, can describe the love between divine personages, for sure, and certainly between humans and the divine. But perhaps more surprisingly, it can also describe the love between humans. And even more unexpectedly, prema can describe the love between a human and an animal, and between other non-human beings, suggesting the ubiquity of this purest love. Now I say surprising because if you read extensively in the Chaitanya tradition, that word prema is reserved for something else. So I say on the other hand, the Chaitanya school, school's adaptation of the word prema is reserved only for the very rarely achieved highest state of perfect love for God, suggesting the rarity or scarcity of prema. This paper asks then, is there such a disparity between the Bhagavata's employment of the word and that of its employment in the Krishna Bhakti theology of, Chait of the Chaitanya school? And if there is, then how do we put this together? This, I think this study calls into question the sort of uh, questions relating to the constructive theology of a tradition that goes on within various traditions, question of scriptural hermeneutics, perhaps looking at the question of exegesis versus eisegesis. You know, are theologians of the tradition reading into the text, forcing words and ideas, as it were, to match a theological vision and doctrine of the school? Should traditions revisit, return to the very sacred texts upon which their theological vision is based in order to respect, revise, reconsider its tenets so as to prevent a reification uh, of its vision and even to correct earlier doctrinal understandings and further to give fresh, meaningful understandings to its doctrine. So in this study, I, I'm going to show you, I'm going to take you through sort of a tour of texts. Um, and I'm going to suggest that, well, many of you who know me know that I have the highest regard to writers like Jiva Goswaman and Rupa Goswaman and the, the great theologians of the Chaitanya school. However, I find myself in the awkward position of, of differing from them because of the way the Bhagavata presents the idea of prema. So there's the tension. I will suggest that this bifurcation of prema can dangerously undercut the school's bhakti metaphysics of divine love that it wishes to promote by creating a non sequitur between the erotic imagery employed at the highest level of its vision of supreme love, creating a disunitary bhakti metaphysics. The divine erotic uh, and nothing to do with the worldly erotic or romantic, uh, let's see, this is uh, uh, bad writing here that I'm dealing with, um, and, and, and yet theologians like Jiva Goswami admit that there are similarities between the two, but yet divorces the two entirely. Consequently, they overemphasize perfection in moksha and fail to recognize the laukika erotic with the alaukika erotic, allowing for a truly unitary bhakti metaphysics. So let's see what I'm talking about here. So the Chaitanya school of prema is clearly very, it's a, it's a rarefied form of, of love. And here are the steps to achieve prema. You can see you've got to go through all eight steps. And then finally, you achieve the perfection of prema. But this reminds me a little bit of the Yoga Sutra uh, with the uh, Ashtanga Yoga, where you have the eight limbs and finally you get to samadhi. But like the Yoga Sutra, that's the translation, with once you've attained prema, there are seven more steps. So there's a perfection within the perfection. So in samadhi, there is savikalpa samadhi and then nirvikalpa samadhi and, and, and so on. And I won't go into the, those details, but enough said that within perfection, perfection is not perfect enough. It has to go deeper, it has to go further. Yeah. 
The tradition takes a great deal of trouble to describe the difference between kama and prema. As I recall in Jack Hawley's book, At Play with Krishna, it's probably so old he doesn't even remember what's in it, but, sorry, but, um, but I think even in the Ras Lila dramas, pilgrimage dramas, I even think they, they even talk about the difference between kama and prema. I seem to recall that, is that correct? Yeah. So it's even there, it's it, even the, this distinction is even there in popular, you know, uh, pilgrimage dramas. So, you know, in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, it's very clearly stated, kama, prema, the characteristics of the two are different, just as iron and gold respectively have in their very nature very different characteristics. The desire to please one's own senses, in my opinion, is to be called kama. The desire to please the senses of Krishna takes the name prema. The gopis give up everything for the sake of Krishna. The motive of their pure and passionate love is the happiness of Krishna. Now note what happens here. The natural love of the gopis is without any trace of kama. It is without fault, blah, blah, blah. But, and it, it, the, Krishna does Kaviraj Goswami, it goes into it even more and even more. But then, in the second, uh, the Madhya Leela portion, far away from the first set of verses we just saw, Krishna das Kaviraj describes the love of the gopis for Krishna as Kama. So he's rejecting Kama in favor of Prema, and then later tells us, let's call it Kama. So what is going on here? I'm the, the fellow who's going to solve this mystery, okay? I think. Even Jiva Goswami, very much, again, bifurcating. Kama is of Maya Shakti. Prema is of Chit Shakti. The t never the twain shall meet. He even goes into, he even defines it grammatically. He goes into elaborate in the Preeti Sandarbha. He goes into this quite elaborately even uses grammatical terms, Sanskrit grammatical terms, um, uh, saying there's sort of a, a parasmaipada, parasmaipada prema, which means that, there's a, that the, the, the agent of action uh, moves to, to an object, is serving the object, whereas atmanipada prema is, you know, there may be that love, but it, it's, it's benefiting oneself. So that would be an atmanipada prema. Here, Jiva Goswaman, quotes uh, the Vishnu Purana uh, as the love among persons who lack discernment is devoted to worldly objects or persons. So let that love of mine be devoted to meditation on you. May you never depart from my heart. Now, he, you know, here Jiva Goswami is struggling to, to make sure that we understand that that's a different kind of prema. So he bifurcates prema. But he's troubled by the way that one can be no longer uh, re retracting one's devotedness to things of the world, but take that same devotedness and devote it to Krishna. So, so what happens between that? It's, it's not quite clear. So the scarcity of prema looks kind of like this. Uh, prema first is only found in bhakti, vaidhi bhakti, and it's at a very developing stage. Then it's at a uh, uh, you know, an achievement stage, a perfectional stage, and then there's a greater intensification of prema, which is where the kama comes in. Okay, so kama, in the in the alaukika sense, is an intensification of prema, and that's what's going on in raga bhakti. Okay, so, but this has nothing to do with this world, nothing. Okay, let's go to the Bhagavata's prema. We've all been waiting for that, right? But in the interest of time, we're going to have to move quickly. Human conjugal love, the word prema is certainly used, a voice choked up with great love. A husband is prema shila, or one whose character is filled with love, while a wife is one who offers herself with devotion, bhaktiya. My uh, doctoral advisor, John Carmen, said bhakti is only for Krishna. Here we find it for a husband. I've suggested that to my own wife, but uh, she's not uh, fond of that idea. So we'll, but that's not relevant to this discussion. Okay. Human conjugal love still, a wife is to serve the husband 
with love. The narrator of the Bhagavata describes Devayani's words to her husband, King Gayati, as being immersed in pure love. I mean, and the, 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 the examples, you know, go on. Fraternal love. Indra touched both feet of King Prithu with pure love. Human love for the earth. King Prithu loved the earth as a daughter. So it's hard to, you don't find the bifurcation, I would argue, in the Bhagavata, but you find it in doctrinal Chaitanya Vaishnavism. Love between animals. There's prema, apparently. There was an increasing love between the grown cows and their mothers. A small deer had anger arising out of love for King Bharata. And Prema in erotic human context, with the tender arrow of her glance, she pierced him, Puranjana, with her eyebrow intoxicated with love. Now again, you know, yes, we can bring in different contexts and so on, but clearly the word Prema moves around the text very far and wide. Now, there's also prema in divine romantic context of the Bhagavata's Raslila, the five-chapter episode on which I've concentrated uh, quite a bit in my research. And I've uh, nicely color-coded for you the parts with uh, using the word, uh, engaging the word prema. And we don't really have time to read all these verses. But uh, these are evidence. So, so clearly it's in uh, the Bhagavata, in the Ras Lila, which is considered by the Chaitanya school to be the Sarva Lila Chudamani, the crown jewel of all Lilas, as Vishwanatha Chakravarti says. Okay, so plenty of instances there. Uh, he gazed upon them with pure love. Now, if we look at the Rasa Panchadhyaya, Rasapachadayi, we find actually a little bit of a solution to this problem. When Krishna disappears and then reappears in front of the gopis, the Raja Gopika, the gopis ask Krishna about three kinds of love, or not necessarily three kinds of love, but three relationships to love, I would say. The first relationship is uh, some love only those who love in return. Some, however, love those who may not return their love. Some do not love in either of these ways. Please explain this to us. Okay? So the gopis are very curious about this. Of course, they're wondering why he disappeared. So this, they want to understand his love for them. Friends who love each other yet ultimately strive for their own self-interest. So again, there's a, the egocentrism is what the tradition, the Chaitanya tradition, is concerned about. And really, that's what the Chaitanya tradition tosses all love in this world into, is this first kind of love. You might say selfish love, egocentric love. But look what this says. Those who love others who may not offer love in return, as either parents do or persons of compassion do, they are persons of dharma who are without fault and are truly endearing. So the Bhagavata passage doesn't say only if you worship Deva. It doesn't say that. It really is so much more broad. And then some do not even love those who offer them love, let alone those who are not loving toward them. They are either, you know, sages or, or inimical persons, and the commentators have a lot to say about that, and that's not within the scope of today's discussion. So the ubiquity of, of prema, I mean, it, it extends to the animal realm. It, I don't know, I should maybe broaden that. Animal, earthly realm, the human realm, and the divine realm. That's my reading of the Bhagavata. The Bhakti Sutras, though, give us some, uh, Bhakti Sutra give us uh, some guiding words. And the, te the Bhakti Sutra, you know, there are arguments about when the, the text occurred. But by the time I think we get the text, clearly it is a text that evolves bhakti further. Because whereas in the Chaitanya tradition, there are five primary rasas, as you all know, probably the Shanta, 
Dasya, Sakya, Vatsalya, and Shingara, the Bhakti Sutra comes up with 11 forms of asakti or rasas. So this is a text I think that looks back on some of the theologizing in the tradition. So they say indescribable is purest love, prema, and its essential nature. But then it goes on to describe prema. And um, we'll skip over some of these uh, passages. The qualities of nature are left behind. That is to say the trigunya. Selfish love is left behind. But this is the key verse or key text. Not, not this one. This one. Prema is subject to the qualities arising from primordial nature, which are essentially threefold. Because of the effect of these qualities, various shades of prema exist. Or because of disturbances and any other mental conditions, various shades of prema exist. So here, this text is willing to acknowledge that prema is there everywhere, but perhaps it's a very dark shade or a lighter shade, or a very light shade. Even in ta uh, 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 Tamasa <laughs> Prema, which we could call it, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, notice there's no Vishuddha tamas, Tamas. There's no pure darkness, but there is Vishuddha Sattva. So even in Tamas, there can be just even the slightest dormant shade of prema, according to this. So various factors determining prema. I'm going to have to go through this very quickly. I'm watching my time, so you don't have to hit that very obnoxious bell that uh, someone put up here. Um, but three essential elements. So these are all the things that need to be taken into consideration in such an examination. First of all, the three essential elements of love, sacred or profane. The lover, love, and beloved. Then the recipient of love and motive to love can determine the quality of that love. If one is after, the, if a lover is, is focused on the lover's pleasure, this is selfish. But if the lover is focused on the beloved's pleasure, that would be selfless. But for the Chaitanya school, it has to be the divine. So there's only theocentrism and egocentrism. There's nothing in between. But I propose a category in between, which will come up in a second. The effect of loved object. So if one is loving a worldly object, that will, that will um, elicit an imperfect love. If one loves a divine uh, object, divine beloved, perfect love, pure and increasing in intensity, will occur. Then there's the question of purity of heart. These are all considerations that the Chaitanya school works with. But now I'm trying to broaden this a bit. Purity of heart. So lover with darker shades of love will be blind to beloved's heart and divine within. Such a lover will be insensitive to the other, insensitive to otherness. Whereas the lover with lighter shades of love will be able to see beloved's heart and divine within to a greater or lesser extent. So I think that these incremental stages are important to acknowledge instead of this total binary, you know, black and white distinction. Metaphysical context. Again, I've spoken of this earlier. Maya Shakti, again, temporal, affected by the gunas. There is no love, just kama. Whereas a uh, lover situated in chit shakti is eternal and is focused on the divine beloved. Lover situated in chit shakti and, and so on. Anyway, much of what we've just already said. And love as ontological constituent of living beings. The tradition itself speaks of, of love being essential as a, as a kind of uh, um, irreducible quality of the self. It's not just an eternal self, it's, it's a loving self. So here's the scarcity model, and I'm going to wind up here. I have about four minutes left. The scarcity model sees this world and the other world as completely separate. We have bhakti, vadi bhakti, prema, and then prema mahabhava. 
is the highest level within prema. And kama is spoken of here, alaukika kama, is really found at the highest levels. Until then, it's a kama. And kama pervades this world down here, laukika kama. And one is pretty much covered over completely by the, the gunas, even sattva guna. The ubiquity model of prema would look something like this, perhaps. Prema may be very minuscule, but it's there. And it just expands as one rises to transcendent realms. In the meantime, laukika kama expands downward, gets bigger as it goes downward. And a laukika kama, uh, it, again, intensifies as one goes higher and higher in the rasas. So my synthesis model might look like something, uh, might look something like this, where really there is these two going on at the same time. The Bhagavata really works with this, and the Chaitanya school really works well with this. And I don't see that there's much of a contradiction in putting the two together. Here's my new leo, uh, neologism, about which I'm very proud, probably uselessly, but anyway, um, there seems to be a, a gap between egocentrism and theocentrism. So I couldn't find a word that would work as other-centric, being centered upon another person selflessly. And so I went to the Latin, and alius, uh, aliud, means other, another person or another thing, so I call it aliocentrism. And so the more you go up the scale here, the more to more sattvaka realms, you know, you, one, the self experiences more aliocentrism. So the full spectrum of prema manifestations might start as low as tamasa prema and just go all the way up to, of course, uh, now I'm going down the page, uh, to vishuddha sattva prema, ragatmaka bhakti. So I'm suggesting um, that th the tradition really look at this carefully and not go against what is counterintuitive. I just saw a YouTube video of, two, of a debate in Vrindavan by two scholars, very knowledgeable scholars, and one said, kama is kama, prema is prema, never the tw twain shall meet. They have nothing to do with each other. The other scholar was saying, actually, they, they, there is some relationship. So there seems to be even an argument going on today about this. And do you call this kama, or do you call this prema? Uh, that's, a, that's a rhetorical question. I don't want to hear what you have to say. It's obvious. Thank you very much. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I've got some uh, pictures. I, yeah, I've got 30 seconds left. Yeah, yeah. These are two male lions, by the way. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, these are my pets. Uh, I have them in my backyard. Okay, that, that was a lie, but, uh, but I thought it might be convincing. Thank you very much. Bhakti and prema, that prema is even higher than bhakti. Devotion, love, devotion, okay, but it's totally selfless. Um, so, so many points of interest you raised, and uh, your, the scope of your paper was also very wide. Uh, you dealt with the prema uh, and uh, not only even uh, with the Chaitanya and uh, ever then we started with the animals and with the Chaitanya and uh, Bhakti Sutra and Bhagavad and ultimately in Bhagavad Purana. So uh, the paper is now open for discussion. It was very good. So Prema is not only for Chaitanya, for Madhva, etc. also very important. Prema, Pumartho, Mahan, they also oh, have yes. the, the, the Purushartha of human life is Prema. So wonderful. In fact, uh, is just uh, Bhagavata is the, the whole Bhagavata, the Bhagavata Sampradaya, the, the concept of Bhagavata, the very concept core of Bhagavata is based and centered around the brain. So, brain is not asked the mic. Should we go over there?
We have a management problem here. Well, I can begin, I guess. Um, thank you for the very thought-stimulating paper. And I wonder, what, what's your thought on uh, how useful it would be to sort of pursue the history of the ideas from earlier times and uh, simultaneously look uh, more into the etymology of the words? So if we go originally to the Vedic idea of Kama, where uh, theorized in, in Mimamsa, where it really is a desirable object that becomes an impetus for um, creating some future state of affairs that is beneficial for oneself, right? But that becomes a fault in the traditions of liberation, and a result of ignorance and reinforcing ignorance. Whereas Prema is uh, sort of much etymologically uh, more like an endearment rather than uh, strictly love. So what do you think it would be worthwhile pursuing uh, sort of the earlier history and trying to see um, the Gaudiya understanding through that light? Yeah, I, I think it would be a fascinating study to consider, um, you know, even the earliest uh, words derivative from the verb root pre and see how they're utilized in a text as early as the Vedas, the Upanishads. I haven't really looked into that. I haven't looked into that. But uh, really from the Bhagavata on forward, with the, in particular with the Chaitanya school, was my main task. And uh, again, this footnote was you know, itching away for 12 years and I finally began to scratch. This is the beginning of scratching the itch. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's not the full scratch. But yeah, that's, I mean, I would be very curious to see what that would uh, yield. Yeah. yeah. The mic has to be big. Not, we are not in the line of vision with each other. So may I? <coughs> so uh, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. We met many years ago when you were very young and I was also very young. <coughs> but be that as it may, I'm happy to see you again. I do not recognize you. <laughs> I hardly recognize myself often. Yeah. <laughs> I have the same problem, so, really. Let me uh, say, if you, uh, I have a question to ask yeah. you, bring out a point, I believe. I happen to have written an article on the Chaitanya understanding of bhakti, including all those you know, divisions of prema and those further divisions. Mm. But it's not based... I would like to see that article. Yes, I will be happy to share it with yeah. you. So, but my question is this, uh, I, I, it was illuminating to me that the Chaitanya tradition does not explicitly bring in this altrocentrism, you know, the yeah. middle path. That's right. It's only concerned with the theocentrism and the egocentrism. Right, right. So, uh, it was illuminating for me to, uh, to realize this. But I would think that uh, a Chaitanya follower would not uh, uh, reject this possibility, uh, mm -hmm. even though it's not explicitly stated in the text. Yes. And the reason for this is that the word prema, as you have pointed out, is used ubiquitously. Mm -hmm. It's applied to all types of things. Yes. And uh, I have made a similar study of puja. Okay. So now, puja can be to a deity, a puja can be even to stones, you know, ayudha puja, even to the weapons and uh -huh. so on and so forth. So, obviously the word puja does not have the same significance in all these cases. Similarly, prema hmm. also does not have the same significance in all these cases. I mean, you are yourself surely pointing out a hierarchy with uh, you know, the various very beautifully portrayed uh, uh, you know, structures that you showed on the screen, mm. you know, of widening and intensifying and so on and so forth. So yes. my, my point is just this, that it seems to me, when you brought to light, that the explicit mention of this is not there in the Chaitanya text. But I would think it would not go against the grain for a Chaitanya person to say, yes, but I do admit this kind of midway practice of prem. Or do you think that they would object to the use of the word prema for the husband-wife relationship and such other type of relationships because after all it is based on the Bhagavad Purana which is the, the most important scripture for the Chaitanya and many of the other such Vaishnavite mm. traditions. Mm. 
Yeah, I think that... Uh,